It is 1920s, small city which was founded and growing in its good network and buildings. Are you going to be the best head engineer to build the happiest and efficient city? Do you want to learn how to play tramways? In this video, we're going to take you through the full rules of the game, and if you stay tuned till the end, you can pick up some tips and strategies along the way. Coming up. Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Ipul University, bringing you a variety of quality board game videos. On this channel, we do a lot of overview, playthrough, review, vlog, and how to play, just like this one. So if you're new here, please consider subscribing to us and do hit the bell to be notified on when we post new videos. Now, let's find out more about Tramways, designed by Alban Viat and published by AV Studio Games. In Tramways, players play the role of town planners and engineers attempting to build the best possible urban development they can in the city of Small City. Through the game, players will play cards from their hands in order to take development actions such as building and upgrading rail, building and upgrading buildings, and finally moving passengers around through the rail network. Through the game, players will earn happiness points for their developments, and after six rounds of play, the player who has earned the most happiness points wins the game. I'm going to go through setup now, but if you'd like to skip over setup, you can check out the link in the description and hit the timestamp to move straight to the rules. To set up the game, start by taking the 12 modular board pieces and taking a number of them equal to the number of players multiplied by 2. You can lay the pieces out in whichever configuration you wish, but more often than not you'll use a rectangle. Feel free to use either side of the tiles, with the ones showing the asterisks being the more difficult configuration. You can mix and match difficult and easy configurations. The only rules for setting up this layout are that you cannot have more than one of the three tiles showing the J parcels, and the total number of parcel spaces, which are these ones, must be at least four times the number of players in the game. Each player takes a player board, and then all of the rail and discs in his or her colour as well as three dollars and two grey rail workers. Make sure all players use the same side of the player board, either this one with the longer stress track, or this one with the shorter track. If using this one, you'll only have one grey worker instead of two. Then place one disc on the starting space of the stress track. To set up the central board, each player places a disc at zero happiness points, and shuffle up all players' discs to choose a random first starting order. Place the round tracker on space 1 and choose 5 of the small building tiles at random and place them on these 5 spaces. Next, set up the cards. You'll have 5 different decks of cards distinguishable by their different colours or the different letter shown down in the corner. This game has a deck building element and so all of the cards will have the same back. In the pale grey generic deck, you'll find five copies of this card and five copies of this card. Give each player one of each and remove any leftovers from the game entirely. With the parcel deck, every card in the parcel deck will have one of the parcel designations on it. Search through this deck and find all of the cards where the parcel designation match one of the parcels on your board. Remove any others from the game. So in this case, all of the C and B parcel cards are not used. Then distribute four of the parcel cards to each player. Under the basic rules, you'll simply distribute these at random, but you can choose to draft them or select them from a pool in turn order. Any parcel cards you have left over after this distribution, set aside for now, you will use them again later in setup. Next, each player places a disc onto each of the parcels corresponding to his or her cards. This lets all players see at a glance who has what cards, because during most of the game these cards will be hidden. Add a white passenger meeple to each of the coloured building squares on the board. Where a building spans two spaces, you will put two meeples onto it. It should look like this. For the purple coloured development cards, shuffle up the entire deck 
and then deal a number of piles of four cards equal to the number of players. Remove any leftover development cards from the game. Then in reverse turn order based on your randomized starting turn order, each player goes through the following process to take one development card. Firstly, pick up any one of the packs of cards. Then look at them, choose the one you wish to keep, not showing it to opponents, and then return the remaining cards to the table, again with one card on top face up. This doesn't have to be the same card that was face up before. The next player will again have four packs of cards to choose from. Once all players have selected their cards in this manner, leave the packs as they are beside the board. Those will come into use later in the game. Each player should now have seven cards, a development, two generics and four parcels, which forms the player's starting hand of seven. Next, set up the auction deck, which is the slightly darker grey cards shown by the letter A. Sort through the deck and take only the cards that correspond to your player count. This one is only used in a five player game, so in the four player that we're setting up, you'd remove it. Next, bring back the leftover parcel cards that you had from before. These are the ones that no one claimed. Flip them over and then shuffle up your auction cards and add auction cards until the size of this deck is equal to five times the number of players in the game. Any auction cards you have left over after this are removed from the game. Deal the number of auction cards equal to the number of players face up next to the main central board. Finally, place out a number of building tiles of each type equal to the number of players minus one and deal out a number of the matching building cards, which are indicated by this icon up in the top right corner of the card, for each of those stacks. Leftover building cards are removed from the game. You're now ready to play. The game of Tramways is played over six rounds and each round has three phases. Auction, then actions, then administration. In the auction phase, players will bid on turn order, and this turn order will hold until the following round's auction phase. As part of the auction, players will be drafting these cards in their new turn order. Some of these are very good, and some of them are actively harmful, which makes this an important part of the game. Then, players will take actions using the cards in their hand. In turn order, each player takes one action at a time. And then, in turn order again, each player may take one or two actions. The player's actions will involve placing or upgrading buildings on the map, placing or upgrading rails on the map, or moving passengers. And each action will require players to discard some cards from their hand into their pool. After moving through the action cycle twice, with all players taking a maximum of three actions in the round, proceed to the administration phase, where players can spend further cards which have administration actions on them, or simply discard cards that they don't want to keep in their hand. Players then redraw to their hand limit, shuffling their discard pile if required, and play proceeds to the next round. So first we'll talk about the auction phase. At the start of the auction phase, all players' discs will be here in the previous round's turn order, or in the randomized setup turn order in the first round. Players are bidding for the new turn order, which will be in effect for the rest of this round up to the next auction. This will affect the order in which players take their actions on the map, and the order in which players draft auction cards because at the end of the auction, each player must take one of these cards straight into his or her hand. Now, we'll see the benefit of what some of the icons on these cards mean later when we get into the actions phase. But as you can see, some cards come with a lot of actions or even new empty parcels. Some come with not very many icons at all. And some cards are actively harmful to the player's chances, especially void cards. Therefore, a player who doesn't mind that much about turn order on the main board will still be interested in the auction to try to avoid these negative cards. So now let's see how the auction works. This is not a conventional auction, where the player who bids the most 
wins the auction. Instead, players will be continuously bidding and paying in order to stay in the auction until they're either leading when it's their turn or until they give up and take the last position in turn order. And this means if played badly, a player can still put a lot of money into this auction, but not come out ahead. So let's look at how it plays out. Starting with the player in the first position, he or she may make any bid, including one higher than 10, moving the disc up to that position and then immediately paying that amount of money to the bank. This can be done either by paying coins or by discarding a card which has that amount of money on it, or a mix of both. For the next player to stay in the auction, he or she must bid and pay an amount of money which is different to all players to the left. It does not have to be higher, it simply has to be different. So the brown player could bid three and then pay three dollars in coins. Player would then pass to the next player who has the same choice. So for orange to stay, he or she could not bid one or three because both of those have been bid but could bid 2, 4 or higher. If at any point a player does not want to bid to stay in the auction, he or she immediately moves to the last remaining position in turn order. So for the pink player in this case, he or she would need to pay 4 or higher to stay in, but not having that much money, decides to simply move to 4th. There is no cost for doing this. Play then moves back to the player on the far left. To remain in the auction, the player must, again, bid a number which is different to any players to the left, of which there are none for the first player, and must also bid a different amount to what was bid on the previous round. So here, the green player could pay nothing more and pass into third position in turn order, or could bid any number two or higher. In this case, the player bids two and pays those two dollars. If at any point it passes to a player's turn and that player has the highest bid remaining on the board, then that player immediately moves to the highest available position in turn order and pays nothing more. So here the brown player wins the auction without having to pay anything else. And so this process continues until all players are finished with bidding. This can be hard to interpret, but consider this situation here for orange. Orange could pass and move to the third position without having to pay anything else. Orange could pay three or more, because that's a different bid, both to his or her previous bid and to Green's current bid, paying that money to stay in the auction and try to beat Green. In this case, it would not make sense for Orange to bid one and pay one dollar, because when it went to Green's turn, Green would be ahead and would still move to second. Orange could simply have passed without paying anything to go into third place anyway. So, to summarise that again, when it's your turn on the auction, you must bid an amount of money and pay it immediately that is different to any players to the left of you and different to your previous bid. You can choose not to bid and move to the last remaining space in the turn order. And if you already have the highest bid when it comes to your turn, you move to the highest remaining position in the turn order. Whoever finishes first in the auction gets this icon, which is the stress icon, and the player must move his or her marker one step up his or her personal stress track. These escalating numbers represent the number of points that the player will lose at the end of the game, and so players need to manage their stress carefully. But there are several ways of reducing stress, which we'll go through later on in the video. Note that if you're ever at maximum stress and are required to take another stress, you'll immediately lose one victory point. Then, in the new turn order, each player takes one of the auction cards. So in this case, brown would choose first, then green, and so on. The card that is picked goes directly into the player's hand, even if the player is at his or her hand limit already. If the player takes a parcel card in the auction, he or she places a disc onto the matching parcel on the board. If the player is stuck taking a void card, then in addition to getting a card that does nothing, the player must also discard one card of his or her choice from hand. This is a once-off effect that occurs only at the moment that the player grabs the void card. Then deal out a number of auction cards equal to the number of players, 
ready for the next round. This means players will know what's coming up in the next auction and will be able to prepare to have a lot of money if there's something that they really want. Next we'll talk about the actions phase. In the actions phase, players in turn order will take at most three actions out on the main board. Firstly, in turn order, each player will take one action, and then each player may take one or two actions, again in turn order. Alternatively, a player may pass any one of his or her actions to gain $2. The exception to this is that on the second pass, when a player can take two actions in a row, he or she cannot pass both of them for $2 each. If the player passes both of those second actions, he or she will still only get $2 not four. The central premise of the actions phase is that when a player takes an action, he or she must discard cards that contain the icons corresponding to that action. Each action in the game requires at least two icons to carry out. For example, building a building on parcel F3 requires the build building and the F3 icons and the player would need to take those cards from his or her hand and discard them in order to take that action. The action to build railways also requires a player to spend one of his or her grey railway workers. As a default, a player may only use one icon on a given card. So if the player wished to build rail to a residential location, he or she would normally have to discard separate cards, one showing the residential icon and one showing the rail icon. But if a player wants to use more than one icon from the same card, he or she can do so by gaining stress for each icon beyond the first. So with this card, a player could build rail to a leisure facility for a single card with one step of stress. So now, understanding these central premises, Let's look at the five types of actions available in the game. The first type of action is to construct a new building. This allows you to take one of these building tiles and place it onto one of your empty parcels. To take this action you require two icons, the construct building icon and the icon matching the parcel. Discard cards containing those icons and then take any one of the building tiles that remains of your choice and place it onto the matching parcel. Take the matching type of industry card and add that to your hand. You'll notice that these vary in quality. Building leisure buildings can be really helpful for your strategy, but it gives you a card that doesn't have any icons on it. Next, take a passenger and place it onto the new building. And finally, gain one victory point. Additionally, if the building that you built was an industry building, the yellow one, then you get to increase your hand limit by one. Take one of the hand limit overlay tiles and place it over your seven to become an eight. You can even turn eight into nine later in the game by building another industry building. But you cannot go beyond nine. The next type of action available is to upgrade one of your own buildings. That's a building tile you've put on the board that still has your colored disc on it. You cannot upgrade the printed buildings, nor can you upgrade another player's building. To upgrade a building, you require two icons, the upgrade building icon and an icon matching the type of building. So in this case, industrial. Discard cards containing those icons and then flip over the tile to its upgraded side. You can only upgrade each building once per game. Immediately gain three victory points. And if there was no passenger on that building when you upgraded it, add a new passenger to the building. The next action we'll look at is building rail onto the map. Before I talk about the action, a couple of quick definitions. Each individual piece of rail that you place is called a rail tile. So this is three tiles. A series of tiles connected together is called a link, so this is a rail link. And if a link connects two locations, either buildings or an empty parcel, it is called a completed link. To take the build rail action, a player must spend one grey rail worker and one of these rail icons for each tile of rail which is placed on the board. 
Additionally, if the player makes a completed link, the player must spend one icon matching one of the ends of that link. Important things about rail icons. This is an icon letting you build one rail tile. This is an icon which lets you build two rail tiles. Each of these three is an icon allowing you to build a single rail tile. And so in order to use this card to build multiple tiles, the player needs to take stress for each additional icon used. So let's suppose a player wanted to build this link. To do this in a single action, the player would need to spend a grey worker, a total of five rail tile icons, and either a C or an I icon. So using these cards, the player could get two, three, four, five rail icons by taking one stress for the extra icon here, and then another stress to get the commercial icon from here. So let's look at some placement rules on the board. Players cannot build rail through an existing building, and players cannot build rail onto a river space. Players can build rail tiles through mountain spaces, but it will cost two rail tile icons instead of one to build onto that space. Players cannot build through an opponent's empty parcel, or an empty parcel that no player has yet claimed, but can build through their own empty parcel. Players can continue their path outside their own empty parcel, and if a player later comes back and builds a building onto that parcel, it will remove the piece of rail that was there and split that link in two. Two pieces of rail can share a tile, but not an edge. And so a crossroad like that is possible, as is two corners splitting a tile like that. But a path like this would not be valid. Completed links can go between buildings or empty parcels, and a player can use the parcel card in order to provide that extra icon for the completed link. Finally, players are allowed to build their links over multiple actions. The brown player, for example, could build an incomplete link like this using a rail worker and three rail tile icons, but not having to play any destination card because it's not a completed link. Then on a subsequent turn, the brown player could come back and play another rail worker and more rail icons, as well as a destination icon to complete that link. It's only once you complete the link that one of the destinations needs to be played. When working on an incomplete link, the first rail icon you spend can be used to remove the last link and replace it with a different type of link, giving you some flexibility to reroute what's going on on the board. However, incomplete links cannot be left indefinitely, and if you go through an entire round of the game without upgrading an incomplete link from the previous round, that link is removed entirely from the board. You cannot build a rail link to an opponent's empty parcel, and so while this is legal from a curve placement perspective, it's not legal from a tile placement perspective. At the end of the game, you will add three victory points for each completed link that you have on the board. It's important to remember this, because while you're gathering most of your points as you go along during the game, it can be easy on your first couple of plays to forget that every completed link is worth three points. This is because it is possible to split a completed link into multiple completed links by building buildings over it. And so it's better to add up all these points at the end of the game than try to modify it as you go along. The fourth type of action that's available is to upgrade a rail link. Upgrading a link requires two icons. The upgrade rail icon and an icon matching one of the ends of the link. So in this case, it would be either a C or an I. Pay attention to the difference between the upgrade rail icon and the build rail tile icon. After discarding cards showing these icons, take all of the tiles in that link and then flip them over to the upgraded side. It does not matter how many tiles there are in this link, it's always only going to cost these two icons to do the upgrade. Then gain three victory points. Once again, this doesn't matter how many tiles there are in the link, it's only ever worth three victory points. 
The fifth and final type of action is to move a passenger. And this is where a lot of your victory points and money is going to come from. Moving a passenger requires two icons. One icon representing the destination and one magnetic strip. This is present on every card except for a void card. Discard cards showing those icons and then proceed with the following sequence. First, take any passenger on the board and then move it along any network of links, whether they're yours or somebody else's, until it reaches the type of destination. This could be a building type or an empty parcel. You can take as indirect a route as you want as long as you don't cross the same building twice. So, for example, if this player wants to move this passenger to a leisure building, the player could choose to take this direct route or could choose to go indirectly around this route. But what the player could not do would be to visit this building twice by going along this route into this building looping around here and then finishing the trip to the leisure building. Additionally, a player must stop at the first destination building which matches the icon spent. And so if the player had spent this card to move this passenger to an industrial building, he or she would not be able to take this passenger and move it all the way to one of these two industrial buildings because the passenger would stop as soon as it reached here. Once the passenger reaches its destination, you remove it from the board. Then you will take three benefits for the total of your trip. You'll start by taking victory point benefits for every link that's used. Then you'll get a bonus based on the type of building that you delivered the passenger to. And then you'll gain money. So let's go through each of these steps. Firstly, the owner of each link traversed gains one victory point per link. So for the path we showed before, the green player would gain 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 victory points for delivering that passenger to the leisure building. The pink player would gain 1 point and the orange player would gain 1 point, even though this happened on the green player's turn. The number of victory points for a link is the same regardless of whether it's been upgraded or not. Secondly, the player who delivered the passenger gets a benefit depending on the type of building to which was delivered. If a passenger is moved to a residential building, then that passenger's gone home and the player reduces stress. If the passenger is delivered to an industrial building, that means you've got an industrial worker on your hands and you get a new rail worker back for building future rail. But hard work is stressful and you will gain one stress. If you deliver a passenger to a commercial building, then once again commerce is stressful and you'll gain one stress, but you gain $5 or gain a development card. These are the purple cards that if you remember you gained one of at the start of the game. Exactly as at the start of the game, pick any one of the four available stacks, look at all of the cards in the stack, choose the one of your preference to go into your hand and then, once again, return the stack with one card face up. Finally, delivering a passenger to a leisure facility allows the player to spend money to gain happiness points. People are happy when they engage in leisure. Players must spend money in the form of coins, they cannot use coins that are printed on cards, and then gain an appropriate number of victory points. The number of points you gain is shown on your help card as well as all of the other benefits for the other types of buildings. You'll gain more value for money if you spend lower quantities of money, but you need to take multiple actions to get those points. And so you'll have to weigh up what is the right amount of money to spend at once to maximize your points. Finally, you can also deliver a passenger to an empty parcel, but you won't get any benefit for that. Finally, the owners of the rail links get paid for their links being used. A link is worth $1 per tile, plus 50% rounded up if it's been upgraded. So for example, this link is worth 4. This upgraded link of 5 tiles would be worth a total of $8. When a player uses his or her own link, the money is paid to the player by the bank. When a player uses a link belonging to another player, the money is paid to that other player by the player whose turn it is. 
money is paid in the order in which the rails are traversed. So when considering this passenger moving to this leisure facility, the player would earn two coins for traversing this upgraded link, eight coins for traversing this upgraded link, would have to pay two coins to the orange player, then would gain one coin for that link, two coins for that link, and two for that one, before the passenger is removed from the board. Note that if the time comes to pay an opponent and you do not have the money to do so, then no further payments occur for the entire journey of that passenger, and you gain one stress. So this is a situation that you want to avoid. So always remember that those are the three benefits and they occur in that order. First victory points, then the benefit of the location you visit, and then payments for using the links. This is most important in the case of the leisure facilities. You cannot spend the money that you gain from traversing the links to gain points at the leisure centre on that same turn. So those are the five actions. Building buildings, upgrading buildings, building rail, upgrading rail, and moving passengers. Remember that each player will take one action in turn order, and then will take one or two actions in turn order before the actions phase ends in any given round. And if a player passes an action, he or she will gain $2, but will not gain an extra $2 if passing both of the actions in a row. After this is finished, proceed to the administration phase. In the administration phase, players can discard cards that have administration action icons on them in order to take those actions. Then they can discard cards. There are four different administration action icons in the game. Money, a grey worker, a passenger, and decreasing stress. You'll see these on cards intermingle with some of the icons that are used in the actions phase. And it's important to know that you cannot use these cards in different phases. So if you want to use a card for its action icons, you won't be able to use its administration phase icons. If a card has multiple administration phase icons, you can still use both by taking a stress as normal. So in the administration phase, you can discard a card which shows a money icon to gain that much money in coins. You can discard a card that shows a grey worker in order to gain back another grey worker. Note that you cannot have more than two grey workers at a time or one on the hard side of the board. If you discard a card with the passenger icon, you can place a passenger onto the board at any location of your choice. And if you discard a card showing the decreased stress icon, reduce your stress one level. At this point, it's important to point out the consequence icon shown at the bottom of some of the cards. To play this card, or even to discard it from your hand, requires you to pay $3. Discarding this card from your hand say to use it as a ticket or just to get rid of it, would cost you increasing one stress. Note though that with the void cards, this icon reminding you to discard a card when you draw the void card doesn't occur when you discard that card. This is a once-off effect, but in this case, this effect, increasing stress, would still occur. Finally, after playing administration actions, you can discard any number of cards, but while the first card you discard is free, any subsequent cards will cost you $1 each. Furthermore, if you're discarding any cards that show a consequence like this one, you would still need to pay that consequence. You will draw back up to your hand limit as part of the end of round phase, and so discarding cards here is a way of getting rid of cards that you don't want. But be warned that your hand limit is not that much smaller than your total deck size, so there's a good chance a lot of these cards are going to come back through to you. Then proceed to the end of round phase, and this works differently after the first four rounds compared with before the final round of the game. In a normal round, you'll first draw back up to your hand limit. Draw off your draw pile first, and then shuffle your discard pile, and draw the rest of the cards from there. Next, all players check their level of stress, and if they are on the highest stress level, then lose one happiness point. Check the position of the round marker, and then any buildings of that type with no passengers are refilled with a new passenger. 
then increment the round marker to the next round. Make sure all the auction markers are on the first row and proceed with the next auction. When play passes into the sixth round, you don't redraw your hand as usual. Instead, go straight into the auction for round six. In the round six auction, there are no cards that you're bidding for, so we're only bidding for turn order. And whoever comes first in turn order in round six gains two levels of stress instead of one. Then all players hang on to the cards that they kept at the end of round five, that is the ones they didn't discard in administration, and then look through all of the rest of their cards, choosing cards of their choice up to their hand limit. This allows players to fully optimize the final round of the game. Then proceed with the final round as usual using the hand that you've crafted for yourself. After the administration phase and the sixth round is complete, then the game is over and proceed to end game scoring. Players cash in leftover money for one point per ten dollars. Then players gain three points for every completed link on the board, regardless of its length. So in this place, the green player would get 21 points for seven completed links. Then each player loses points based on the current position on the stress track. The player with the highest score wins, and in the event of a tie, whoever has the most leftover money wins the game. If still tied, victory is shared. And that's how to play Tramways. We hope that you enjoyed the video and we hope that you enjoy playing. If you'd like to learn about the many expansions for Tramways, we have videos where we will explain how all of those play. And you can check that out from the link in the description below. If you enjoy this video, please let us know by hitting the like button. Write your questions or feedback in the comment sections below. You can also join our Facebook group, Meeple University Community, to share your love for board games. And finally, if you'd like to be among the first notified of what's new from Meeple University, please consider subscribing to our channel. You can click on the Meeple up in the corner to do so, and do hit the bell for notifications. Until next time!